Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the second Sunday of Easter comes from our Gospel reading of John. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thomas doubts. The rest of the, the, uh, the, rest of the disciples do too. And so do you, so do we. That's all been established already. We went over that last week on Easter. Because even on Easter, when we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, sometimes we can find ourselves wondering why in the world we're even doing such a thing. Because if we only allow the things that make sense to our rational minds and tangible bodies to rule the day, we can't help but doubt. I think that Thomas might get the short end of the stick sometimes, because of that doubting moniker that stuck with him throughout the centuries. But I'm glad it stuck. It helps to remind me that I'm in good company. The disciples, they're hidden away in some secret room for fear of the Jews. The shutters, they're shuttered to block out any peering eyes, and all the locks, they're locked to keep out anyone who would want to do them harm and to bring about some sort of evil. And this, of course, makes sense. For if they could arrest and crucify Jesus, who had the power to do anything he wanted, to perform miracles, then they could certainly arrest and crucify any one of his followers who don't have the power to do anything they want and who can't perform miracles. And so even though they had been told already by the women that Jesus was risen, even though Peter and John had seen the empty tomb, with the shroud folded all alone and the face cloth set neatly aside, they were still full of doubt and fear. And who could blame them? One tends to believe the most logical solution to strange events before they would ever begin to entertain the impossible. And so Jesus, he comes to them. And what a comforting thought that is. Jesus comes to the terrified ones, to the fearful and doubting and frightened ones. And he doesn't expect them to be able to put aside all of their fears and doubts. They're sinners, after all, and sinners just can't bring themselves to overcome the sin that plagues them so intently. But a locked door isn't going to keep Jesus from those who he desires to comfort if a giant boulder couldn't keep him sealed in the ground, if death itself couldn't keep him dead, then what could a simple lock do to him? He stands among them. A miracle in and of itself right there that was only overshadowed by the miracle of him risen from the dead. He speaks a word to them. Of course he does. For that's what the word made flesh always does. But his word isn't the type of word that we would expect. And it certainly isn't the type of word that we would speak. For if I were Jesus, the first thing that I would say would be a word spoken in anger. I would have said, I can't believe you're still hiding away, locked in some secret room, after everything that I've told you. Time and time again, I explained how all of this had to happen, and now it has. After hearing the good news that the women told you, the women that I sent to you, and Peter and John, after running to the tomb and seeing it with your own eyes empty, how can you still all be afraid? I'm ashamed of you. I should have picked others to be my disciples, people who would have had stronger and better faith than you. That's what I would have said. But Jesus, he doesn't say any of this. Not to them, because that's not what the Lord of life says. That's not the type of word that the God of all grace and mercy speaks to a sinner who's locked himself away, captive to his own fears and doubts and crippling shame. 
No, Jesus speaks a word of gospel, a word of peace, a word of forgiveness of sins, which is the only type of word that will do any sort of good for a terrified sinner. And let us ponder that just for a moment. Where the sinner lets his sin lead the way in conversation, where the sinner wants to see those who have sinned against him grovel on their knees, where the sinner wants to see at least the smallest attempt at amending all the wrongs that have been committed, the sinless one doesn't even allow those things to enter into his mind. Peace be with you. That's all. Just peace. And not a peace that we would think to find in a serene field of flowers, but the peace that ends all war. Peace, he says to them. Your war with God is ended. Your heavenly Father isn't angry with you. How could he be? Didn't you see how all of his anger was poured out on me? He has no anger left. It's all been emptied out, every single last drop. And I'm not angry with you either. I know that it was your sin that sent me to the cross. I know that each one of you has denied me, if not in words, certainly in deed. But I took all of that sin upon myself. No one can take my life from me, but I laid it down willingly, and I laid it down for you. And then Jesus shows his hands and his side. There is the proof that the price for peace has been paid in full. Now certainly, he could have resurrected his body to a perfect and natural state, free from those holy holes and that gaping side. But he kept those scars of the cross so that he could forever stand in the heavenly courtroom with evidence to prove that all sin is forgiven, that all death is killed, That Satan no longer has any word to speak against you before your heavenly Father. And then, he has another word. Not so much for the disciples, but for you. Just as the Father has sent his Son to the cross in order to accomplish the salvation of mankind, so too is Jesus going to send his apostles so that they might proclaim that cross and salvation into the world. Do you see it now? This miraculous upper room behind locked doors conversation, it was for you. Jesus had you in mind when he went to the cross, and not just you, but everyone. And so he had you and the world in mind when he appeared to his frightened disciples and had this conversation with them. For this good news of the cross was not going to stay buried in his tomb Neither was it going to stay buried in the tomb of the disciples once they had all run their course. The cross must be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, and these men were going to be the ones that God used to start that never-ending Easter proclamation rolling. But the word of salvation is more than just a word about the cross. For the cross actually accomplished something. And that something wasn't about to stay nailed on that tree. That something was going to be, is, and always will be proclaimed. And not just proclaimed, given. Jesus, he breathes his Holy Spirit upon his disciples. Ordains them into their apostolic task of proclamation and distribution. Sins are going to be forgiven. Real sins, really forgiven. Just like the sins that locked the disciples away in that secret room had forgiveness spoken over them in real time and space, so too is that same forgiveness going to be spoken over your sins and my sins in real time and space. The church as we know it began that first Easter morning, not just with the resurrection of our Lord, but with that resurrection being given into the hands of the doubter, placed onto the lips of sinful men, that they might go out and speak a word of peace to all of us who are terrified because of our sin and because of our doubt and because of our fear.
and dread and worry and shame and impending death. And perhaps that's the greatest miracle of all. The forgiveness of sins that was won on the cross is proclaimed and given freely through the hands of sinful men. Jesus has built his church upon the sure and certain hope of the cross and the empty tomb, which means that the church is built upon the things of inexplicable grace, impossible to fathom mercy, makes no rational sense forgiveness. War between God and man is now ended peace. And so we find ourselves here at Wheat Ridge Evangelical Lutheran Church 2,000 years removed from that first Easter morning, eight days removed from last Easter Sunday, so that the peaceful words of the forgiveness of sins, won on the cross and assured through the resurrection, can be proclaimed and heard, can be given and received. No, we're not hiding away behind locked doors out of some fear of our impending death, but... Yes, we do certainly lock ourselves behind the fears of our sin, don't we? And the beautiful thing is, the peace and forgiveness spoken here is the exact same peace and forgiveness that was spoken there. Jesus, he didn't wait for his disciples to come running to him, groveling for another chance to make things right. Instead, he came to them in their sin, right where they were, and spoke peace to them. And he does the same for you, too. He comes to you, right where you are, in your sin, and through the lips of a sinful man who's no more worthy to speak these things than the disciples were, Jesus speaks his forgiveness to you. End of story. Case closed, your sins have been crucified and buried with your Savior, and his resurrection victory is yours. And then, maybe even more miraculous, his forgiveness that gives to you the sure confidence that you stand before your Heavenly Father, fully forgiven and forever at peace with him, is the same forgiveness that enables you to leave this sanctuary this morning so that you can find all of those who are hiding away from you because of their sin, so that you can speak Christ's peace and forgiveness to them. Imagine that. God doesn't want the sinner to remain terrified in his sin. He wants the sinner to know of the cross, to be assured of the resurrection, and to hear that his sin is forgiven. And Jesus is going to use his church to accomplish that. But what happens next Sunday? After you've spent the week accumulating your sin and doubt and fear all over again. After you've locked yourselves away from your brothers and sisters. After you locked yourself away from Christ himself. Well, I guess you'll find yourself here with me. Again, so that we can both hear Jesus speak his peace and his forgiveness. The miracle of Easter, continuing on from that very first Easter morning until that great and glorious day when Christ comes again in his glory. And so, in case you missed it the first time, or in case you dozed off as I first climbed up into this pulpit, Let me once again speak the words that the Lord has given his church to proclaim to terrified sinners. Peace be with you. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus.